Hey guys, it's Paul, combat veteran, MMA fighter, YouTuber, and today we are checking out one of the most requested Arch videos. This is Arch's look at the death core of Krieg. Now it's technically part of the Siege of Vrax playlist, and it is a long one, an hour and 15 minutes. So we might just do this in two parts. So let's get into it. But before we do, of course, check out the merch store. The link is below. We've got all kinds of fun Warhammer parody shirts and other ways uh, to rep the channel. We've got mugs, stickers, you name it. Also, be sure to check out my new Twitch channel. Just opened it up. Uh, the link is also going to be in the description. And it is going to be the single point where I am going to be doing all of my streaming. This is because I have the two channels. They're both grow growing at a pretty good clip. So I'm trying to centralize all my streaming in one location. Of course, check out the second channel and check out the MMA podcast I recently started with my brother, The Cage Potato Show. Okay, having promoted all that, let's check out some Deathcore. Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to the first video in the Siege of Vrax lore series. We will begin, of course, with the most anticipated video in the series, that on the Death Corps of Krieg. Much has, of course, been made about these rather famous fighters and their dour attitude, their willingness to sacrifice, and, of course, the fact that their world is an absolute hellhole on a scale that is rare even within the Imperium of Man. But did you know that once Krieg was a veritable paradise world? It was rich from wide-spanning trade, export, and produce. And whilst it lacked the natural beauty of a true paradise world, being of course a hive world, it was prosperous. Its citizens were about as happy as any imperial citizen of a hive world had any right to be. And That's not saying a ton. And ruled by the Council of Autocrats, it was a flourishing society that would go on to flourish for hundreds of years. I love how the Council of Autocrats, I wonder if that's their actual title. I mean, I would appreciate them just dropping the pretense of being like, no, no, we're like Council of C Citizens. We're Council of, of uh, you know, w Wisdom. And just being like, nah, we're the Council of your hereditary aristocrats that run your society. Until finally, the ruling class decided that since they were doing such a damn good job of governing Krieg, that they deserved a little extra. After all, every few years they had to offer up significant percentages of their total produce, their wealth and industrious resources to the wider Imperium. An Imperium that barely even knew that Krieg existed. After all, when was the last time that the wider Imperium did anything for Krieg, eh? When was the last time that it had done something for the Council? Why should the Council of Autarchs, the very reason why the planet was doing so well- Autarchs, okay, I, that's, that's not the term for an autocrat. An, an autocrat is an autocrat, right? Autarchs, or autarchy, is interesting because it's an economic concept. And a country that espouses autarchy aspires towards self-sufficiency. They want to minimize the amount of essential trade goods that they import, right? And minimize and, of course, be able to produce everything that they need in-house and then export. And some of this is considered a national security thing. It was pretty common among military uh, dictators, <clears throat> excuse me, dictatorships in the 1980s in Latin America, where they attempted to produce all their goods in-house, but it's not really possible, right? In theory, you think, oh, well, if we have our own electronics industry, our own uh, car industry, our own food industry, it's possible, you know, but it's not really... These industries tend to do just horribly. And a lot of times they're too complex, like complex goods require supply chains that just can't be met in almost any country. Even if you wanted your own domestic car industry, say to manufacture your own military vehicles, you would still have to probably import your steel or your rubber. Uh, 
or your lubricants, right? There, it, no matter what you do, or if you could make those, you would still need to import precursor materials like iron and uh, and you know rubber trees and, and that sort of thing. So it, 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 the autarky orientations for economies uh, sounds really good. It sounds like, oh, pride and self-sufficiency, but it only works if you were a very, very simple like agrarian society with a really limited need of manufactured goods. So it's funny to me that whether this is arch or whether this is the lore describes this ruling class as autarchs because, of course, an autarch would resent incredibly the Imperium uh, extracting some of their resources and would put a premium on self-sufficiency. The irony, of course, being if you're a hive world, you probably get your food from off-world, from the Imperium, right? And if the Imperium was a little more smartly run, they would structure it that the ruling class receives the vast majority of their luxury goods and the sources of their wealth and power, say weapons and even the military uh, that supports them. Uh, would receive it from the Imperium, and the common people would receive their food from the Imperium, or perhaps their best quality food from the Imperium. And of course, you brand that real hard. You let them know that their their best processed meat comes from the God Emperor himself, you know, Double Eagle Industries or whatever. Uh, that's a much better way of controlling a population because it lets them know continuously and nonstop that they are beholden in a visceral, concrete way to the wider Imperium. I'll have to suffer these deprivations at the hand of an Imperium that hardly even cares. And due to these extortionist ties, many of the planet's ruling elites had to languish in a mere two or three palaces. Surely they reasoned that if only Krieg's resources was left to Krieg alone, as was only right and proper, they could make everything so much better. Of course, the Council was well aware that some of the more narrow-minded people on the planet might view such ideas as downright treasonous, which was of course a blatantly ridiculous idea. It was, of course, the Imperium that had betrayed Krieg, not the other way around. Nevertheless, for the time being at least, plans would have to be laid in secret until Krieg was ready to redress this injustice placed upon it by the extortionist tactics of a tyrannical empire. And the Ortar Council had been in charge for a very, very long time, so once they decided they were going to secede from this tyrannical empire, it didn't take long before their plans came to fruition. Having seized control of most of the governmental organizations of Krieg, along with the various governors of the Hive cities and most of the planets... You know, the irony should be lost on no one that the defining campaign of the Death Corps of Krieg is almost a re-fighting, in many ways, uh, it sounds like, of their initial rebellion against the Imperium. I'm curious to see how long the parallels remain. PDF and Imperial Guard regiments... It looked as if their coup had not only succeeded, they had succeeded beyond their wildest expectations. It began with the High Autark declaring martial law, and once his forces were in position, utilizing the surprise and confusion that this declaration had garnered, they declared that they were seceding from the Imperium of Man. At this point, the Council's loyalists were already in control of the vast majority of Krieg's infrastructure and military. Loyalist forces had been placed around those Imperial Guard forces whose loyalties could not be guaranteed. There was resistance, but it was confused, unorganized, scattered, and in most cases already surrounded. Yeah, it's always interesting to see how sometimes it can be disturbingly easy to enact a coup. Uh, the classic example that I always think of is the Bolshevik Revolution, in which case the wildly unpopular government of Moscow, or, or Tsar, really, was overthrown, sort of, by Bolsheviks basically killing the Tsar and his family, seizing control of a few key buildings, and uh, 
simply declaring themselves in charge of the country. But like a lot of these coups, things tended to get pretty messy pretty quickly. It seemed like a really decisive win for them, right? And the new Soviet government declared that the you know, First World War, that the Russian government was going to be withdrawing from it. Um, they signed a, a absolutely humiliating treaty in which some of the, the Soviet unions, the new Soviet unions, uh, key industrial centers were basically ceded to uh, Germany. They had effectively vacated their trench lines entirely. And, of course, the people doing the negotiation for the Soviets were random Bolshevik revolutionaries, certainly not trained diplomats. So there was a lot of problems at the outset. And once the First World War ended, of course, it didn't take long before the white Russians, these were Russians who ranged from uh, uh, general free market capitalists all the way to people trying to restore the czar, and sort of neo-fascists, they all sort of fell under this banner of the white Russians and went to war against their comrades. And the civil war in Russia lasted until probably, I think, the late 20s. And some pockets of resistance remained, I want to say, through like the 50s. Needless to say, in order to win that war, the Red Army had to abandon a lot of the core principles of their communist utopia and look more like a military dictatorship which of course they became and so i i suspect we'll see this in krieg as well that even a coup that is initially very successful tends to self-sabotage as as happens when you replace a even quasi-functioning government with one run by individuals with zero governmental experience, right, whose only experience is being a small guerrilla war irregular force. And yeah, things tend to fall apart pretty quickly. Let's see if that happens here. One of the few exceptions to this rule was Colonel Yurton's 83rd Krieg Regiment, stationed in the high city of Ferrograd. Ferrograd's governor had been... Ferrograd. Okay, interesting. Iron City. All right. Definitely some references here. Sympathetic towards the ideas of the council, but had not yet fully made up his mind. The council had let him run free because they were of the impression that he had, and that he was going to join them, something that in the end he probably would have if it were not for the swift actions of Colonel Yurton, who moved to seize control of the hive in a military coup. Perograd subsequently became the focus point for the remaining Imperial Loyalist forces on Krieg, of which there were depressingly few. Some had managed to break out from the traps laid for them, or otherwise avoid the notice of the traitor forces, but they were hilariously outnumbered. And Fedograd appeared to be literally the only hive on the entire planet that had managed to remain fully within Imperial hands. Now, of course, a hive city is a formidable defensive work in and of itself, but completely alone, surrounded on all sides, on a hostile planet, and having received word that Imperial reinforcements were not coming, the Colonel was left with a bit of a dilemma. There was simply no way that he could win this by himself. He could hold out possibly for years and maybe a decade if he was extraordinarily lucky. But without additional Imperial reinforcement from the wider Imperium, there simply was no realistic hope of victory, and said reinforcements were not coming. The Council of Autarchs were entirely aware of just how wide and massive the Imperium was. They were also entirely aware what the consequences of betrayal were. That is why the first objectives of their uprising were the orbital defense silos protecting Krieg from enemy invasion. I'm always perplexed at this idea, and I guess over a million worlds, there's going to be a tiny number that are just stupid, right? And I almost would respect it more if the Autarchs made this choice and were just like, we are going to do this. We're going to rebel. We're going to be killed, but we want to die as, as, as free men, right? We'll die as free people. Uh, but this idea that you're going to seize power and you're going to live this like life of great luxury uh, and that the Imperium is just going to let you go, uh, 
there's zero indication that the Imperium will allow this in any sense. And almost every time you have these homegrown rebellions, again, the Cold War is the classic example of this, where all sorts of internal grievance, civil wars and insurgencies and insurrections would consistently proclaim themselves as either capitalist or communist and would come with their hat in their hand to one of the Cold War powers seeking resources and support because these groups recognized that they were never going to win without external support. You notice that, for example, like the FARC in Colombia, right? How long did they continue their operation after the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Once they did, once they weren't getting supplies from the USSR, they had to become basically a narco organization that sometimes fights the government. But you see that a more rational course of action, which actually I think we're starting to see in VRAX, is that you need to find some equally powerful external help as a check against your opponent. Even in the American Revolution, right, the U.S. forces, once they displayed a certain baseline level of battlefield proficiency, once they could achieve some level of victory against the British, they immediately petitioned the French, Britain's great power rival of the era, to aid them monetarily with arms, ammunition, and training. And the French did. And that is basically what enabled the U.S. forces to continue to fight the British. So I, I really want to emphasize that you don't become an autocrat of a country or of a planet or even of a city without understanding cost-benefit analysis and never ever putting your neck out there when you don't think that there is a worthwhile payoff probability. Krieg was a vital world within the Imperium, one of considerable importance, and thusly its defenses had also been prioritized quite highly. And in this particular instance, Krieg being a massive hive world, its planet-side defenses were already formidable in the extreme, every single hive city being home to billions of Imperial citizens, potentially millions of PDF troops, and gargantuan defensive works built into the cities themselves. If the enemy managed to reach the planet, the hives would be able to hold out for years. And even better, if the hives had access to massive anti-orbital defenses, any invasion force could be reduced significantly before they even set a single foot, boot, tentacle, or whatever else they might be walking on, on Krieg soil. Obviously, the planet was, at the moment, at least, embroiled in a civil war, which would weaken these defenses to some degree, but the Imperium simply could not spare the sheer number of troops and ships required for an invasion of Krieg. And that was assuming that Colonel Jürgen could remain defiant until the Imperial forces could be assembled and finally make the transit to Krieg. When in all due reality, whilst it was possible that the Colonel could hold out for an extended period of time, being surrounded, outnumbered, and considering the fact that the Council knew that it was very important to finish him off before any theoretical Imperial reinforcements, his defiance was, in all due likelihood, measured in months at least, and years at most. And whilst that might sound plenty, the Imperium is a vast place indeed. Not to mention, the invasion of a planet like Krieg would require substantial dedications of manpower. The recruitment of these troops, their training, their organization, and their eventual transportation to Krieg, not to mention the Imperial Navy elements required, could take years, if not decades, to find. Yeah, I, I understand that communication is really tough in the Imperium, but this is another reason that... Cold War powers loved indigenous insurgents and insurrections is because the if you, you the hardest part right galvanizing people to resist the other side is already done someone else is already doing it for you and so all you need to do is provide them a comparatively small number of resources or troops and 
the existing insurgency is able to execute that that resistance in a way that just is much easier than having to do it yourself. So in fact, again, you have to think with this Colonel Jurgen character, right? He has an army. He has an army and they are loyal to the Imperium and they are resisting effectively, right? At least at the moment, they are effectively resisting the uh, rest of the planet. So the Imperium doesn't need to raise and train a whole army. The Imperium doesn't need necessarily to, you know, uh, bring in a naval battleship. Remember, it may, they control a hive city. There may actually be a clear landing platform for the Imperial Navy, right? As long as they get in the right part of geosynchronous orbit, etc. You know, so I think this idea that the Imperium would offer this effective resistance no help at all is sort of ridiculous i think absolutely they would try to divert even if it was a question of hey we're going to shift a pdf from the neighboring sector to land on the ship distribute a bunch of supplies fight there for four years five years right and then rotate them off world nothing nothing crazy about that again we're talking about not millions of soldiers but 10,000 well-equipped PDF, uh, even just airdropping things like arms, ammunition, food, medical supplies onto that hive city again and again, keeping their defenders fed, equipped, and firing would have been potentially a decisive difference maker. And that is, that requires almost no planning, right? It's not even, it's no soldiers that you need to contribute. So again, uh, the saving of having this even if the, the Colonel Yuri never advances, he offers them a beachhead, right? A, la- a secure landing zone and all the resources and knowledge of a hive city. And I want to point out an expert commander on the ground, which is absolutely not trivial, right? This is someone who they can land and can tell them about enemy disposition, enemy tactics, enemy strengths and weaknesses, and offer the Imperium a ton of information. So to allow this city to fall because the Imperium doesn't have the time to raise a full invasion force is preposterous, completely preposterous, and strategically a terrible choice. And organize. The simple fact was that the Autarch's schemes had succeeded beyond their wildest expectations. The Imperium had absolutely no idea this was coming, and as such, not even the most cursory preparation had been made in case of a Krieg uprising. This left Colonel Jürgen with very little indeed, except for his final orders. Before the traitors knocked out his antenna and therefore his communication with the wider Imperium, the order was for him to resist, with all means at his disposal to engage the enemy, to punish their treachery, and emerge victorious, whatever the costs. Along with this message was a single attachment, a string of binary code, which once presented to Ferrograd's tech adept revealed the location of a vast armory beneath Ferrograd, along with a second lengthy string of binary code. Launch codes. Finally, on the day of the Feast of the Emperor's Ascension, all the preparations were complete. Suddenly, the traitor forces of the Ortar Council found themselves assaulting undefended positions. They pushed further into the hive of Ferragrad and found nothing. Until finally, they arrived before the titanic blast doors leading into the hive proper. Sealed, shut, and welded. Before the secessionists could really start figuring out what this all meant, it was all made blindingly obvious to them. As the earth beneath their feet started to shake and massive pillars of flames reached skywards. Kilometers away, the operators of Auspex systems could only watch on helplessly as dozens and then dozens more until hundreds of Auspex contacts were rising up from the hive city of Ferragrad. Auspex contacts? Is this, does he mean like radar contact? I mean, I assume he means that, that, that they've la- they're launching ICBMs. 
It turned out that the hive city of Ferograd had been chosen to store vast quantities of dark age of technology weaponry of the nuclear kind and of a wide variety of flavors as well. Some of the weapons were designed to explode in the upper atmosphere, scattering nuclear radiation across the entire planet. Others were designed to land on major secessionist hive cities and take care of them in a somewhat more conventional fashion. The result was that first the planet was ravaged by hellish nuclear firestorms, and when those subsided, the planet was then covered in nuclear winter. And who doesn't love a good old-fashioned radioactive snowball? So what is interesting, or depressing, depending on how you look at it, is that nuclear weapons, right, the nuclear winter that they talk about, is a function of the fact that it is believed that in a full-on nuclear exchange at the height of the Cold War, enough ash may be kicked up into the atmosphere to actually uh, darken the sun and cause a... Uh, cause difficulty in things like growing conditions and cause a slightly cooler um, earth for at least a couple of years. Now, this is problematic for a host of reasons. Um, it's been known to happen in a response it, it, as a result of tremendous volcano explosions. Um, I want to say there's some evidence in the in the record that. I think Mount Vesuvius, when it erupted, caused this sort of effect. But there's also a lot of, but but a lot of this is speculative, you know, and a lot of it is uh, Cold War era fear mongering. The reality is that there are some models for what would happen in the event of a nuclear exchange, but the question is is still very much undecided. Now, all this to say, right? that if you launch dark age of technology nuclear weapons a la 40k who knows what would happen we know that 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 era of technology featured frighteningly powerful weapons and undoubtedly their nuclear weapons were probably uh very advanced compared to our own but that said our advanced weapons are very very advanced right we have what are called merved icbms and that is where we've taken a bunch of Thermonu uh, thermonuclear warheads, right? Bear in mind that the original, uh, the original bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were pretty crude fusion devices, fission devices, and the U.S. and Soviet Union quickly engineered within you know five or six years uh, a fusion bomb, a so-called super bomb. And of course, there are several ways that you can make those weapons even larger still and increase their yield. But the nuclear weapons that now exist are orders of magnitude more powerful than the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that's dangerous enough. Then we've taken those weapons and we've merved them, which is taking a six or seven different warheads, giving them their own independent guidance system, and sticking them into the same ICBM. So it gets launched up into the atmosphere, drops down, and then spreads apart each of the six to 12 warheads tracking their targets independently, right? So sometimes you have six warheads and you'll say, hey, I want three to hit Red Square in Moscow, or I want four to hit the Pentagon in the United States. But you might have four more go to Camp David or to NORAD or take your pick, right? And this is the danger of these merved warheads is that even if you somehow had some sort of orbital defense system, if one missile gets through, that represents 12 nuclear weapons, a really frightening level of devastation. And of course, that is the technology of 2020. Not to say what the technology of the year 20,000 would look like. Now, of course, then it's really only... Also, detonating warheads in the atmosphere can short-circuit unprotected electronic systems, which seems like it may be the case here. I'm not sure if the Warhammer 40k universe in lore um, electronic systems are shielded against EMPs. It seems like they would on something like a hive city, where electronic systems are essential to the functioning of things like waste disposal, water flow, food distribution, that sort of stuff. But also the Imperium is cheap and 
doesn't really think things through often. So I wouldn't be surprised if detonating a nuke in the atmosphere just shut down the electronics of uh, these hive cities. At least so much you can do to prepare yourself for a literal nuclear apocalypse, but the citizens of Ferrograd, those deemed necessary to the continued survival of the Imperial Loyalist population, and of course its defenders, had done what they could to prepare themselves for the nuclear fallout they were about to unleash. The secessionists, however, well, they didn't even know the weapons were there. And as such, their preparations were... <laughs> less than entirely adequate. Now, of course, once again, I must mention that Hive Cities are designed to survive pretty much anything, but only if they're given enough actual notice to prepare for said eventuality. A direct nuclear strike, well, while survivable, it was certainly going to strip off quite a bit of ablative protection, not to mention a few thousand hab blocks. In the same manner, Krieg's PDF and secessionist regiments were relatively well prepared. Relatively well prepared in that they were fairly well equipped and the nuclear eventuality were amongst the list of things they were potentially prepared to deal with, but with virtually no warning, well, again, the mere fact that they could have been prepared yeah, I'll, I will tell you this, that in the U.S. military, we have in every battalion a nuclear, biological, and chemical protection officer and nuclear, biological, and chemical uh, administrative staff who are experts in this specific field. And I'm here to tell you that the actual, the theoretical readiness posture is actually pretty high. There's mop gear for basically every company. Every soldier is issued a, an MBC mask. Uh, much like our friends uh, the Krieg wear, but in practical terms, without some better guidance, right, without being told, hey, make sure you have your mop gear on hand, make sure you pull your mask out of storage, functionally, our posture, the military's posture, would be, do very poorly in the event of a nuclear strike. And I don't think that's a secret, right? It's The, the military is very public about its operations, and the fact is, without the, there's an expectation that a nuclear exchange would be preceded by ever heightening tensions between the two countries, uh, but, or between the two adversaries, and that the U.S. military would have time to raise its posture in response to these heightened tensions. That said, again, uh, maybe you're conducting your final assault on this rebellious hive city the last rebelling hive city um and you think they could try anything and so yeah maybe those troops were told hey gas masks on hand mop gear on hand uh know what bunkers you're gonna get to it's possible does very little for the fact that they were not prepared once the in this case literal firestorm had died down and the nuclear dust had begun to settle the secessionists were not done for. They had not been destroyed as some had hoped, but it had certainly leveled the playing field. As it now stood, the Loyalist possessed millions, possibly as much as a billion or two civilians, which could eventually of course be turned into yet more meat for the grinder, and an unnumbered quantity of Imperial Guard regiments, probably stretching into a couple million as well. The secessionists still held the considerable military advantage, but they now found themselves fighting in an irradiated wasteland. This meant that they would have to deal with actually surviving first and fighting a war second, whilst the surviving loyalists found themselves with no such impediments. After the loyalists launched a major campaign of counterattack, the two sides eventually settled into a long and protracted stalemate. The situation in which both parties now found themselves, that of fighting amidst an irradiated hellhole of a landscape, meant that there weren't actually too many areas of the planet that could actually sustain extended combat. 
The population had long since retreated far below ground, and combat now took place either in large-scale underground engagements where both parties were digging tunnels against one another. That is insane. I can't even conceive of having to fight in a, an enclosed tunneling, like a tight tunneling type space in like a sewer type environment or like an underground tunnel complex. It would be terrifying, especially at scale, right? It's one thing to have to clear a house with small arms, but it would be another thing entirely to have an enemy where you try to, let's say, trap them. Um, you know, imagine having being in a tunnel and having both ends sealed shut and you're trapped inside indefinitely uh, until you suffocate or starve. Um, just the idea of having these places collapse on you, having to fight in ultra tight quarters. You saw that the Vietnamese or in the Vietnam War, the U.S. had what they called tunnel rats. And that's because the Vietnamese were experts at digging uh, tunnel complexes, entire bases that would involve... Um, you know, troop quarters, uh, supply, logistics, uh, even uh, medical clinics in these uh, headquarters effectively dug into hillsides. And the entrances were usually extremely small. The areas were extremely dark and terrifyingly, right, they could collapse at any time. So especially in response to U.S. bombardment. So that's terrifying, but even more terrifying is that the U.S. forces had designated soldiers, not a special role, just someone who drew the short straw, uh, known as tunnel rats, who would have to go in and investigate these uh, North Vietnamese bases, which could range, again, from a, a small, you know, two dozen people who had dug a small tunnel network with two rooms, all the way to a gigantic multi you know, several dozen soldiers, uh, a battalion level headquarters underground effectively. So the idea that there were soldiers, U.S. soldiers that went in with a 45 and a flashlight and they were expected to clear this area, which again would be booby trapped potentially, um, is terrifying, terrifying, even in a war that was already pretty terrifying, right? It sounds just, just hellacious or in limited above-ground engagements. This particular form of warfare turned out to be... remarkable. On the one hand, the trenches needed to be occupied at all times in case the enemy launched a surprise attack. However, the men that actually had to occupy those trenches could only do so for extremely limited periods of time before they were exposed to lethal doses of radiation. This meant that the men on the surface would have to constantly be cycled in and out to at the very least extend their lifespan. Don't get me wrong, once they were deployed on the surface, their life was a finite resource. Something that would come to greatly colour the nature of Krieg's warfare, but at the very least, the resources that was their lives could be spent as slowly and grudgingly as possible. A second side effect of this very limited operational time was that any offensive had to be planned to be absolutely gargantuan. Once large numbers of forces were dedicated to a surface conflict, they had to gain some ground. Every available man had to be thrown against the objective in literal human wave style warfare to assure that at least something was gained from the expenditure of their lives. But again, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I'm struggling to understand the constraints they're under. So, okay, you want to fastidiously safeguard your soldiers' lives, then you're going to want to employ them in low-risk engagements. You're going to want the enemy to take the huge risks while you make them pay for it. In contrast, right, and this is that's the style of warfare of the professional armies of like the high Middle Age and early Renaissance, right? Those armies would be armies for hire. They would have their own troops, their own formations, their own drills, their own equipment. And because the experienced mercenaries were of such high value, they would be their combat was actually done pretty sparingly. Right? They would withdraw under low levels of casualties. Their 
they would again often meet mercenary forces that they uh, had dealt with, worked with before, or had fought against before. Until you would have these sort of like, and it was also just expensive to field an army, right? And it was even more expensive to raise an army. So taking casualties was seen as so high risk that instead warfare became uh, quasi ritualized, right? Forces would meet, there would be a skirmishing, and one side would quickly withdraw once it appeared that there was the slightest hint that the battle was not going in their favor. In contrast, in the Napoleonic era, Right, that is when you started to see mass conscripts with low levels of training, low levels of uh, lower levels of, of mass produced equipment, a quad- sort of proto industrial army. And those armies were much more dynamic and much more willing to advance and maneuver and take casualties and push the enemy. It was just a lot, a big change in warfare for the era, but it responded to the incentives. Right? The incentives were tons and tons of lives and conscripts, tons and tons of weapons that you could mass produce and field in the battle you know, again and again. And it was a function of the fact that through good maneuver, because you were able to communicate with your forces effectively, that through effective tactical maneuvering, you could gain a decisive advantage over your opponent. And so those lives were spent much more aggressively. But yeah, this idea that offensives have to be huge, that they have to gain ground, uh, the, the, the incentives don't make any sense to me, right? It, 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 lives are really cheap. I understand they want to harken back to World War I where lives are cheap and offensives had to be huge with the hope of breaking through enemy lines. But... World War I, I think, had a fundamental issue with generals in that era that really were so fixated on the old way of war that they weren't able to conceive of using innovation and new tactics to overcome their problems. Instead, they were trying to just continuously throw bigger and bigger offensives at the problem, not realizing that a winning strategy may actually have been to just grind out your opponent and let them let them throw themselves at you and considering the fact that the vast majority of men commit there's also sorry some some geopolitics at work in world war one because germany was occupying a big chunk of france and the allies actually had to force uh germany back whereas germany could achieve a victory of sorts by just remaining in place it's into such an action were essentially already dead men walking once their names were called. It meant that the war was a slow one indeed. The casualty numbers apocalyptic. It became all-out warfare, with every man, woman, and child dedicated to nothing but the eventual end of the conflict, which would finally arrive 500 years after the ruling Council of Hortax turned their back upon the Imperium. And as for that very Imperium, they had turned their back on Krieg in return. It turns out that the Council of Ortax weren't entirely mistaken. Once Krieg was turned into a radioactive hellhole, the White Imperium simply had no use for them. It might sound cynical, it might sound monstrous indeed, but the simple fact was that the benefits of reclaiming Krieg were dwarfed by the costs of... This is the realistic Imperium that we know and love. ...doing so. And as you can probably imagine, after 500 years, it gave us quite a shock to the Imperium when they were contacted from Krieg. A planet that they had long since written off as a death world at absolute best, and in all due likelihood, simply just a dead planet. And whilst, of course, the savior of Krieg, and amusingly enough, its destroyer, Colonel Jurgen, was long since dead, the people of Krieg had inherited his goal of one day returning to the Imperium of Man, and so here they were, but they had nothing to offer the Imperium. Their world was still a nuclear hellhole and would remain so for quite some time yet. This was not the thriving merchantile hub of years gone past. 
This was a little more than a radioactive ball hurling through space. What could such a world possibly have to offer the Imperium? Oh yeah, we know this story. Okay guys, let's see. Let's actually... There we go. Let's pause it there for today, right? I am actually going to start my stream here in a little bit. I got to get ready. But this is so far a really interesting series, and I can't wait to get deeper into it. We're only like 20 minutes into this hour and 15 minute video. So man, there's going to be so much more cool information about the Krieg. But if there's stuff that I got wrong, of course, let me know in the comments. I do read them all, even though I don't always reply as much, as frequently as I would like to. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to check out the second channel, the merch store, the podcast, the Twitch channel, and support the channel with a shirt. And then until next time, I will see you guys later.